Good evening. It is my pleasure to be here tonight uh, to talk with you about NASA's eye on our magnetic variable star, the Sun, the Solar Dynamics Observatory, um, and SDO, as Camilla and her friends call it. I'll show you. I'll talk about Camilla towards the end. Is the microphone on? Yep. Okay. Uh, so this is how you would see the sun if you looked out on any normal sunny day um, uh, in New England. And it is what our eyes have evolved to, to look at. It looks just kind of a, a plain yellow uh, descriptionless uh, ball of gas. Um, it is our, it's our closest star, and it's, uh, it's mainly yellow. So now if you were able to go above the atmosphere and look with a telescope at the sun, in, again, the wavelengths, wavelengths that are visible to our eyes, you're going to see that, it, that again, it looks like a big yellow sphere. But what you're, going to, what you're going to start to see is there are these black spots, these dark spots. And these dark spots are sunspots. They're a manifestation of magnetic fields. So there's, the sun is very magnetic. And these spots are not constant. They've been observed since the 1600s and probably, possibly even before that. Um, you can observe this uh, from the ground, but uh, it takes uh, kind of a specialized setup and don't ever look directly into the sun <laughs> because it will blind you. Uh, but this, is, uh, this shows us that there's a hint that there's some magnetic fields involved. So again, those sunspots are magnetic fields. They're like very, very, very strong kitchen magnets. The image here is a bar magnet with iron filings, so something that's magnetic. And it's showing you that this is what the magnetic field lines are shaped like, those arcs, those large arcs. Um, so you're, we, we figured if the sun is magnetic, there should be some type of shape like this on the sun. And so to give you an order of magnitude, those kitchen, uh, those kitchen magnets are around 50 gauss, the unit that we, that we talk about with mag uh, magnetic fields. On the sun, it's 1,000 gauss. So the sun is much more powerful than these little kitchen magnets. And so those loops that you saw, follow, that iron filings that, that were following the magnetic field lines, you can also see in the sun when you're looking in the extreme ultraviolet. So this is, these are wavelengths that your eyes normally can't see, um, but with special filters and telescopes, we can, we can observe these. And so as you see, there's burbling, there's, there's flows, there's all sorts of motion. And this is all hot plasma um, following those magnetic field lines. Every 11 years, there's the solar, the solar cycle happens. So there's an increase in sunspot number, and then a decrease, and then an increase, and a decrease. And so right now, we're here in 2012, and we're building up to a major part of activity in, the, in those magnetic sunspots. And that magnetic activity causes other things to do, and the sun influences our everyday life. It helps us by heat, by light, as well as this magnetic, these magnetic changes really start to influence, influence our everyday life. And I'm going to talk about those effects um, called space weather. Um, and that's the interaction of, of the sun and, and what it does with our Earth. So we go to this, the satellite launched uh, recently, the Solar Dynamics Observatory. And why we're talking about it is that its whole purpose was to um, look at solar variability and how it impacts the Earth and how it affects our life, uh, especially our technology. All of our cell phones that we use, all the GPS, the fact that we take air, airplane flights everywhere, these are all impacted by how the sun is, how active the sun is. Um, so we need this telescope with a series of telescopes uh, to really understand that and how it affects the near Earth in many different wavelengths at a very high cadence and very, very quickly. So these space weather th um, events that I'm going to talk about, um, there's two of them. So there's the flare, which is basically um, an a, I think it's uh, close to a billion atomic bombs going off um, at one point in time. And those are very energetic. There's particles going everywhere. It's a big explosion on the sun. Um, the second event is a coronal mass ejection. These coronal mass ejections are billions of tons of material that the sun spits out and it comes hurling towards Earth. This is not to scale, but this is uh, just so you could see. The Earth also has a magnetic field. It's relatively weak compared to the sun's, but it still has one. And it's good because it protects us. Um, so this is a magnetosphere. And uh, that protects us from a lot of the interact, but it also interacts with the coronal mass ejections. 
Um, and then we have an atmosphere that's, that is barely visible on this scale uh, that is our last line of defense against the extreme ultraviolet radiation. And to put this in perspective, this is a coronal mass ejection taken, um, a picture taken by a satellite of a coronal mass ejection. There's the Earth. So that coronal mass ejection could completely engulf the Earth many times over. So these are huge, large events that could really sweep by Earth and, and take us out. Now, it's not all horrible things that, that all these particles are coming towards us and all, all this dangerous radiation. There's also beautiful things, such as the aurora. The aurora is caused um, in the atmosphere when, uh, when the CMEs connect with our magnetosphere and allow the particles from the sun to rain down in our atmosphere and create these beautiful colors. Now, other things that happen when we, uh, when we have this connection between a CME or, or uh, the flare, um, there's many different things. For instance, um, you induce currents in oil pipelines. So a few years back uh, in Russia, there was a, a pipeline that actually corroded very quickly and broke, and people thought it could possibly be sabotaged. It actually was an induced current um, from these magnetic storms. It can dis, uh, dis, um, disrupt electric grids. It can take down whole power grids in uh, Quebec, uh, it was down for several weeks because uh, because it overloaded the system, and you know no power, so no power to you know cook, no power to power your cell phones, your your TVs. Um, it's a danger to airline passengers um, in terms of extra radiation. It's very dangerous to astronauts uh, to get this extra dose of radiation. Um, airlines also have to reroute their uh, reroute their planes because it disrupts radio signals, so you don't have that, and it dis uh, di disrupts GPS. So as you see, this is very, it's a, there's a far-reaching consequences. And it doesn't just affect humans. Um, dolphins and homing pigeons both, um, both migrate and, and uh, move at, or navigate by um, a mag sensing the Earth's magnetic field. And so when the Earth's magnetic field is shaken and, and um, disrupted by these events, they also tend to get uh, lost or, or end up uh, being beached. So this is one of the examples of um, the blackout time, and this is 20, uh, a blackout caused by um, by a solar flare. <laughs> wow, we no blackouts here. <laughs> so, um, what you should notice is Detroit has a has a rather large, and that's my hometown. So, Detroit is uh, Detroit has a rather uh, bright spot. Long Island in New York is is very bright. Boston over here, uh, Albany, so some uh, some places that that we're familiar with. And then after that a blackout occurred, Detroit is basically black. Long Island is much reduced. Boston is actually on a separate power grid, so we were not taken down by that. But also uh, Albany, Toronto is dark, Ottawa, all lost power. And it, that lasted for quite a while. So if we flip back and forth, it's really, you know, you, you think about everything you use electricity for these days. It's very important to understand this. And there's ways to mitigate it. You can... Uh, make sure that the power grid doesn't go down um, by changing settings at, at power stations and power relays and, um, and putting in safe, safeguards. But you can't do that all the time. You need to, you need to have a, a way to predict. And that's why it's so important to study the sun and its activity. This was a, a slide from the Homeland Security about these power grid cascade failures. And again, thinking about everything that is based on your uh, power supply. And you know we all think of the kind of the things that go on at home in terms of cooking, but very quickly it ends up doing things like emergency services. Um, hospitals really don't have a they have emergency generators, but they're not going to last forever. Um, so within a few weeks, emergency services are compromised. Um, government services, banking is compromised. It could lead to uh, a, quite a catastrophe. And there was a prediction that um, the economic uh, outcome of a major solar flare would actually be 20 times the cost of, of Hurricane Katrina. Um, so these are major issues that we have to deal with. So in comes SDO, and we're going to help uh, understand and predict the space weather and minimize its impact on humanity. So Solar Dynamics Observatory was launched February 11th, 2010, uh, from Cape Canaveral. There are three instruments aboard, the Atmospheric uh, Imaging Assembly, AIA, Extreme Ultraviolet Variability Experiment, EVE, and the Helioseismic and Magnetic Imager, HMI. I'm probably going to refer to each of them by their acronyms um, on the following pages. 
So first, and the one that we're proudest of here at SAO because we built it, um, was AIA, the Atmospheric Imaging Assembly. So this is, the goal is to study um, the atmosphere of the sun, all those magnetic loops that you saw. So overall, this is the SDO spacecraft. AIA are those four telescopes up on top that take a, many picture, a picture every quarter of a second. Now, the basic design is it's a uh, Ricci uh, Criterion uh, telescope. And uh, this is a telescope that, that is used in, in most, uh, modern, uh, teles most modern satellites. So you have some light source. Uh, enters, hits one mirror, bounces off another, and then is focused onto a CCD camera. Things such as the CACs are, are this type of telescope, as well as Hubble. So this is, uh, AIA has a long heritage of, of the, or we've used a lot, of, uh, a lot of these telescopes before, and AIA is just one of the latest. And it, another benefit of AIA is simply the evolution of this, of uh, high resolution as well as high, ti high tame, time cadence. SOHO is the picture to the left. The middle picture is a stereo, and, uh, which is a unique uh, set of um, spacecrafts that there's one trailing and one, um, one uh, ahead of the Earth. So you get a stereographic image of, of the sun. And then SDO. Um, what happens is that we increasingly get better with spatial resolution. So we can tell exactly what is going on in these, in these active regions. The other thing is that we've increased our cadence. So we've gone to something like once an hour, to once every 12 minutes, to once every three quarters of a second. Now moving on to the second, uh, second instrument on SDO, the Helioseismic and Magnetic Imager, HMI. HMI maps the solar magnetic fields. So it's going to see those sunspots and peer beneath the, the sun's opaque surface um, using helioseismology. It's much the same as, as what, you, um, what one would do for volcanology or for uh, earthquakes um, on the Earth. And the goal of this is to find out how the sun creates that magnetic field, because those magnetic fields are key in making the, um, in making the flares and making the CME. So if we know how it's going to make those magnetic fields, we can then translate it into um, how, how we're going to end up with a flare and a CME. This is a, a movie of the uh, HMI data. And these are those sunspots. So it is just amazing that uh, you can see them merge and start to dance around each other. Um, and this happens all the time. There is so much detail in these pictures. Um, I heard one fellow, one fellow uh, who studies this basically say that he gives up. He can't possibly explain all of, the, all of this uh, information that's going on at once. So the third instrument aboard SDO is the uh, Extreme Ultraviolet Variability Experiment. Um, it's going to me measure that difference in ultraviolet output. And that radiation is the radiation that directly affects our upper atmosphere. It puffs it up. It breaks a apart the atoms. Um, it tends, if the atmosphere puffs up, you end up uh, having drag on satellites. So all the telecommunication satellites, um, everything else, uh, they, they need more fuel or they lose fuel and they, they break faster than they're supposed to. So that's going to cost money in the end. Um, and researchers don't know how fast the sun can really vary at these wavelengths because these are new observations. So there should be a lot of new discoveries from EVE. So EVE has a very rough imager. So these are not the beautiful pictures that you see from AIA. Um, but what they also do is they, they have the ability to say how much, um, basically how bright those things are um, and how fast they become bright. So this is time versus how bright they become. And, uh, and this is giving us new insight as to when, um, as to how these flares happen. So SD overall weighs 640 pounds. There is 8,000 pounds of fuel to launch it into a geosynchronous orbit. That orbit is 35,000 kilometers above the Earth. Um, and the power that's needed to operate the spacecraft is 1.5 kilowatts. And 1.5 kilowatts is about the average that the uh, power company thinks that, that it needs to run um, a normal residence, so like a two to three bedroom uh, house per day. And uh, the dimensions are 14 feet by seven feet by seven feet. So this is a rather large satellite. And for scale, we have a picture of SDO with people. So this guy's about six foot tall. And uh, this is SDO getting ready to go into her fairing. 
So this fairing is the very top of the rocket that you saw her saw at launch on. Um, so that's in a clean room. That's why they have all the bunny suits on, so that we don't get any contamination as we as we go into space. The other thing about SDO is the enormous amount of data. So the data downlink, we have a dedicated station in New Mexico. We actually have two dishes. Only one is pictured here. Continuous downlink. We're constantly talking to the spacecraft. We end up with, <coughs> excuse me, 1.7 terabytes of data per day. This is the same as trying to download half a million songs every day. I dare your teenagers to try to do that. Um, <laughs> it is a big problem, let me tell you. Um, and uh, so it's similar, it's uh, about 50 times more data than any other mi na mission in NASA history. So that alone has been a huge, um, a huge amount of work here and, and at, uh, at the other institutions. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so just to remind you, going back to the space weather um, incidences or events that we're talking about, the flare, again, many particles, big bombs going off, coronal mass ejections, tons, billions of tons of material come hurling at the Earth, all affecting the magnetosphere, causing auroras, and um, as well as power outages or other things. So this, <coughs> excuse me, the, um, is an image of AIA data in three different wavelengths. Simply color coded so that the eye can I can see it better. All the images come down black and white. Um, so what you're seeing here is you will see the liftoff of a coronal mass ejection. And one of the most interesting things that SDO has taught us is the global nature. You'll see a a CME lift off this way, but then you'll see repercussions over here and over here, um, and other things go on in the sun. All of our previous telescopes tended to focus in on only a small portion, so we weren't able to see this. So understanding the global nature has already um, really changed the way that we look at this, and the telescope's only about, it's less than two years old. Now, CMEs propagate out, um, out towards the Earth, so what we've been able to do with AIA, which it wasn't quite intended to do, was to use it as a coronagraph. So what we were able to do is add up the images on the outside and actually see the CMEs as they take off. So this is a very active sun with all these different magnetic features. <coughs> Excuse me. And, uh, and it's a way to study the sun further out and watch those CMEs as they come towards us. Another tool we have <coughs> is, the, uh, is uh, LASCO, which is on that SOHO satellite. Um, so this is a superposition of, or a, a, uh, we've put the AIA image in the middle, and then this LASCO blocks out the sun so that I can actually see all the white light that's streaming outwards. So you'll see um, ridges come out that are the CMEs uh, coming out towards us. And so this is, again, another way to trace it as it's coming towards the Earth. Now, the other type of event that, uh, that causes space weather is a solar flare. It's a very quick event that happens over here on the limb. And as you see, the sun is, is very active these days. There's lots of different regions, which means there's lots of different um, sunspots underneath there. So looking close up at a different flare, you see that it's a very complicated process. It's not simply just an explosion, but, you, but in order to truly understand this, you need to go, th go through and understand all of these, the wave motions and the flows and, uh, and the brightenings and dimmings that you see in, in here. So this is going back to the other flare. So yes, all these uh, little explosions sending off particles, streaming outward, towards the Earth. So there's, there's a reason to have more than one instrument on, um, on SDO. So at first you, you were seeing the yellow, which is uh, the AI, an AIA image with all of the magnetic fields as they, are, as they are in the hot corona, so around a million degrees. And then fading in and out, are the HMI data, which is where the, the, um, the origins of those magnetic fields are that cause these great explosions. Um, maybe they're not playing. There we go. Um, 
So yes, so combining the two, we're able to see how they originate and then how they pro and then how it propagates, how it forms, explodes, and propagates towards the Earth. So one of the one of the measures of these activities and, and one of the things that I'm involved in is using AIA as a thermometer. Um, so flares can roughly be associated with um, an increase in temperature around those active regions. Um, so AIA looks at different wavelengths, which can be roughly, a, a, um, roughly are, have, give you different temperatures. So if scientists can use this information to properly calculate how many particles and how much there is, we can really be able to save our space assets as well as our ground assets. So in other words, we'll be able to keep your GPSs running and your planes will be able to fly in their polar routes um, as well as uh, keep, you, keep you safe and have your power on. So uh, Christine mentioned earlier that uh, my first talk given here was, was on Hanode a couple years ago. So Hanode uh, XRT, I still love, because again, it was my, my first uh, X-ray telescope. Um, that's out in the corner. And that's, uh, that looks at plasma. X-rays have to be really, really hot. So plasma greater than 2 million degrees. <coughs> you then see the AIA images at 2.5, 1.2, 6.3, 1.9, and 1 million degrees. Um, and in studying this and how they react to the flares, both before, during, and after, um, we can start to learn how to predict and how these temperature changes show what's coming next. So now, flares, flares are one event, but we're also interested in CMEs and how to predict the CMEs. Um, so we're interested in the predictions. We're interested, are interested in how to propagate them, that CME, to the Earth. If the CME is going in the opposite direction, it's never going to hit Earth. Meh, well, it's interesting, but it's not really any impact on us. Um, and then we also want to quantify how much of that energy is going to affect us. So one thing we use is, um, is things like the HMI data, um, that magnetic field data, and then use the various simplest of calculations. So assuming basically, basically a bar magnet, you make the connections of the magnetic field lines, and then you extrapolate them out and are able to, to trace where the CME goes. Yes. Oh, that's just simply to guide your eye. Just simply to, yes. So this image is, a, is what uh, we call a running difference image. So you subtract the next frame from the last frame. So you only see what's changed in, in this. The limb of the sun uh, is this uh, corner right here. And this is a CME going off. The CME is uh, propagating out here with a shock. And <coughs> Excuse me. We know that the shocks um, are a source of the high, uh, the high energy particles, and so again, in using these observations and coupling them with Earth, uh, with Earth satellites, we can learn how to predict and learn how to better, um, better help us understand this event. So the sun has a very vast influence. These observations of, of these active regions by SDO uh, determines all of that high energy radiation that's going to come at us and how much we have to change our electric grid, how much we have to ha have to save our satellites. Um, the modeling of these in concert with, with all these observations can really allow us to predict things much better um, and allow us to, to more efficiently use, use our space. And the variability of the sun changes over these 11 years. And this is also going to help uh, with forecasting space weather events. Now, again, <coughs> as I said, there uh, were about 2012. So we're at an increase in, the, um, in solar activity. This is a plot made um, at NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center by David Hathaway. Um, so over the last couple of years, uh, we, we were at a very long and pro prolonged uh, minimum, which was very different. Um, we, we didn't quite understand why the sun was so unactive. Um, but now it's increasing, and in 2013, early, or late 2013, early 2014, we should hit a maximum. Now, with these maximums, there's all those magnetic fields, all the sunspots that are going to be on the sun. So this means there's going to be more and more activity, more flares. Um, in minimum, you normally have one to five CMEs a week, and you end up going to one to five CMEs a day. Uh, in maximum. And so there's going to be a great increase. And again, it's going to, we're going to really have to be careful and watch this in order to, uh, in order to protect our assets. But again, 
you do get beautiful things out of, um, out of the space weather. This is a picture from the space station, and you see beautiful aurora dancing around uh, over the poles. But you can also do things like damage your cell phone reception, lose all your GPS, and possibly corrode oil pipelines, and we all know we need oil for, for our cars. So even today, as early as today, thank you, Trey, for forwarding this, <laughs> that uh, Space Weather News sent out a directorate that there, due to the recent activity of the sun, um, there might be geomagnetic storms, which will lead to aurora. So uh, this is another way that you can get your information, that this is really a timely thing, and it's constantly evolving. And uh, there are people who you know, watch this day in and day out, and you can get this information um, on the Internet as to when you should start, continue to look up and, and look for the beautiful aurora. And you can follow SDO, SDO and our activities online. There's the uh, NASA website. There's also Facebook. And um, there's little SDO. There's also Camilla. Camilla is our mascot. <laughs> and uh, she has gone all over the world. I have had my picture taken with Camilla. Um, so I feel famous but through her. And uh, yeah, she travels all over and is our little ambassador uh, for Solar Dynamics Observatory. She, uh, she keeps you up to date as to what happens in terms of flares or coronal mass ejections and uh, whether you can see aurora or not. So I hope that uh, through this talk we've uh, convinced you that the sun influences our everyday life and it's a very dynamic magnetic star that, uh, that you should keep your eye on. Thank you.